modern science, medicine, political freedom, the market economy, all of them, we're told, are the result of a sort of miracle that took place 250 years ago. That miracle is called the Enlightenment, a moment in history when philosophers suddenly overthrew religious dogma and tradition and replaced it with human reason. Harvard professor Steven Pinker puts it this way, progress is a gift of the ideals of the Enlightenment. There's just one problem with this claim. It isn't really true. Consider the U.S. Constitution, which is frequently said to be a product of Enlightenment thought. But you only need to read about English common law, which Alexander Hamilton and James Madison certainly did, to see that this isn't so. Already in the 15th century, the English jurist, John Fortescue, elaborated the theory of checks and balances, due process, and the role of private property in securing individual freedom and economic prosperity. Similarly, the U.S. Bill of Rights has its sources in English common law of the 1600s. Or consider modern science and medicine. Long before the Enlightenment, tradition-bound English kings sponsored path-breaking scientific institutions, such as the Royal College of Physicians, founded in 1518, and the Royal Society of London, founded in 1660. The truth is that statesmen and philosophers, especially in England and the Netherlands, articulated the principles of free government centuries before America was founded. So why give the Enlightenment all the credit? Apparently, because it doesn't look good to admit that the best and most important parts of modernity were given to us by individuals who nearly all held conservative religious and political beliefs. The claim that all good things come from the Enlightenment is most closely associated with the late 18th century German philosopher Immanuel Kant. For Kant, reason is universal, infallible, and independent of experience. His extraordinarily dogmatic philosophy insisted that there can be only one correct answer to every question in science, morality, and politics, and that to reach the one correct answer, mankind had to free itself from the chains of the past, that is, from history, tradition, and experience. But this Enlightenment view is not only wrong, it's dangerous. Human reason, when cut loose from the constraints imposed by history, tradition, and experience, produces a lot of crazy notions. The abstract Enlightenment philosophy of Jean-Jacques Rousseau is a good example. It quickly pulled down the French state, leading to the French Revolution, the Reign of Terror, and the Napoleonic Wars. Millions died as Napoleon's army sought to rebuild every government in Europe in light of the one correct political theory he believed was permitted by Enlightenment philosophy. Today's cheerleaders for the Enlightenment tend to skip this part of the story. They also pass over the fact that the father of communism, Karl Marx, saw himself as promoting universal reason as well. His new science of economics ended up killing tens of millions of people in the 20th century. So did the supposedly scientific race theories of the Nazis. The greatest catastrophes of modernity were engineered by individuals who claimed to be exercising reason. In contrast, most of the progress we've made comes from conservative traditions, openly skeptical of human reason. The Enlightenment's critics, including John Selden, David Hume, Adam Smith, and Edmund Burke, emphasized the unreliability of abstract reasoning and urged us to stick close to custom, history, and experience in all things. Which brings us to the heart of what's wrong with today's idolization of the Enlightenment. Its leading figures were not skeptics, open to what history and experience might teach us. Their aim was to create their own system of supposedly infallible truths independent of experience. And in that pursuit, they were as rigid as the most dogmatic medievals. Anglo-Scottish conservatives had a very different goal. They defended national and religious tradition, even as they cultivated what they called a moderate skepticism a combination that became known as common sense. I think a lot about common sense these days as I see American and European elites clamoring for enlightenment now. They rush to embrace every fashionable new ism, socialism, feminism, environmentalism, and so on, declaring them to be universal certainties and the only politically correct way of thinking. They display contempt towards those who won't embrace their dogmas branding them unenlightened, illiberal, deplorable, and worse. But these new dogmas deserve to be greeted with some of that old 
Anglo-Scottish skepticism. Enlightenment over confidence and reason has led us badly astray too many times. I'm Yoram Chazoni, author of The Virtue of Nationalism for Prager University. Thank you for watching this video. To help keep PragerU videos free, please consider making a tax-deductible donation. If you're a movie buff, you've probably seen a picture of a director, thumbs joined together, index fingers forming a square, showing the camera operator how to frame the shot. The camera can't see everything, right? The art of directing is framing every shot so the audience sees exactly what the director wants them to see. We all do something like this in making arguments, whether personal or political. It's not necessarily a bad thing. We only have so much time to make our points. But there is a downside. Often, arguments end up unfairly skewed by the information they include or leave out. If you understand how framing works, you'll have a better chance of seeing through weak arguments and appreciating good ones. Let's look at some examples. Take socialism. Socialism is enjoying renewed popularity, especially among young people. Why is this, given the failure of the socialist model in places like the former Soviet Union, Cuba, and Venezuela? The answer is that socialism has been very cleverly framed by its proponents. Socialism, we are told, is morally superior because it makes people more equal. Those who have more than their fair share have to give it back. What could possibly be wrong with leveling the playing field? Who's against equality? When framed that way, socialism is made to seem the only moral choice. So if you're opposed to it, you're framed as regressive, selfish, and pretty much a jerk. Another example of framing is the issue of religious freedom. The American Civil Liberties Union website says that the free exercise clause of the First Amendment gives you the right to worship or not as you choose. The government can't penalize you because of your religious beliefs. It sounds good, but only because of the framing. The Constitution doesn't speak about the right to worship and to hold beliefs. Those are a given. The Constitution specifically defends the free exercise of religion, and that means freedom to act on your religious beliefs and not to be forced to violate them. And that also includes the right to influence others, just as secular people can. Yet people who want to exercise their religion in these ways are framed as bigots. Martin Castro, former chair of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights for the Obama administration, wrote that religious freedom is a code word for discrimination, intolerance, racism, sexism, homophobia, and Islamophobia. So even if courts uphold your religious freedom, you're still a hater. Speaking of hate, hate speech is another example of framing. Hate speech is not free speech is a common refrain on college campuses. And what counts as hate speech? Whatever people who say hate speech is not free speech find hateful. And that number is growing at an alarming pace, according to several recent studies. There are many other examples. People who question climate change policies are framed as science deniers. People who oppose abortion, even late-term abortion in a healthy pregnancy, are framed as waging a war on women. So how does someone who wants to present the other side of these arguments deal with this framing tactic? First, reject biased framing. Now that you know what framing is, you'll be able to spot it. That's half the battle. Say something like, do you think that's the whole story? Let me suggest another way of looking at it. Second, get yourself up to speed on the big issues. Don't expect someone else to fight your battles. Read up, memorize some bullet points. You know what they're going to say. You hear their arguments all day in the major media and in your classrooms. But here's where you have an edge. It is unlikely they've ever heard your arguments. You might be surprised what happens when they do. Third, set some basic ground rules. Bury the insults, no name calling. General statements are fine, but they need to be backed up with examples. Make it clear that you're prepared to hear their arguments. In turn, they have to commit to hear yours. And then, may the best argument win. If nobody budges, that's fine. You've had a respectful exchange of ideas. 
If nothing else, that's a victory for civil discourse, and we certainly could use more of that. Just don't forget to look out for biased frames. They're great for making movies, but not for finding truth. I'm Jeff Myers, president of Summit Ministries for Prager University. This video was made possible through our partnership with Summit Ministries. For more on bad framing, go to summit.org slash PragerU and download their free ebook, Five Steps to Making Convincing Arguments. If you think the world is a mess now, that just means you weren't around in the 1970s. In Britain, where I grew up, the low point was known as the winter of discontent, a line borrowed from Shakespeare's Richard III. The inflation rate in 1975 was 27%. The trains were always late, the payphones were always broken, nothing worked. Worst of all were the recurrent strikes. Strikes by coal miners, strikes by dockers, strikes by printers, strikes by refuse collectors, strikes even by gravediggers. It felt as if there was no way back. And then came Margaret Thatcher. Between May 1979, when she entered 10 Downing Street as Prime Minister, and November 1990, when she stepped down, she changed everything. Born on October the 13th, 1925, she was an improbable saviour. Nothing in her middle-class childhood suggested the future ahead of her. A diligent student, she got into Oxford as a chemistry major. She worked for a small plastics company after leaving college, but was rejected for a position at the British chemical giant ICI because, as the personnel report stated, this woman is headstrong, obstinate, and dangerously self-opinionated. She needed all three of those attributes when she entered the world of politics as a Conservative candidate in 1950. After several failures, she finally entered Parliament in 1959. For the next two decades, she steadily worked her way up through the party ranks. As early as 1975, Thatcher had come up with a wonderful line about the opposition Labour Party. They've got the usual socialist disease. They've run out of other people's money. This she contrasted memorably with what she called the British inheritance. A man's right to work as he will, to spend what he earns, to own property, to have the state as servant and not as master. This was the essence of Thatcherism, and it was just the tonic that the patient, the British economy, needed. It's fashionable nowadays to argue that there was no Thatcher miracle in the 1980s. Not only is that demonstrably false, it misses an essential point. Thatcherism wasn't just about raising productivity or creating jobs. Just as important was the goal of defeating inflation and restoring prosperity to the middle class. This it emphatically achieved. Yet the event that more than any other defined Margaret Thatcher's premiership was not economic, but military. The Falklands War against Argentina established her irrevocably in the public mind as the New Britannia, a warrior queen who gloried in victory. And of course, it ensured a conservative win in the 1983 election. There's no question that sending the Royal Navy Task Force to the South Atlantic took great political courage. Many in her own party pushed for a negotiated settlement. But the lady was not for turning, not because she was nostalgic for the days of empire, but because the invasion was to her mind morally and legally wrong. Not without reason did a Soviet magazine nickname Thatcher the Iron Lady. Along with her ideological soulmate, US President Ronald Reagan, she was unhesitating in her opposition to the Soviet Union. When the Soviets deployed intermediate-range nuclear missiles in Eastern Europe, she fully supported, despite fierce opposition, Reagan's counter-move to send American cruise and Pershing missiles to Western Europe. It's still terribly hard for those who opposed her to admit it, but Margaret Thatcher was right about most things. She was right that the British trade unions had become much too powerful. She was right that inefficient, nationalised industries had to be privatised. And she was right 
that the West could win the Cold War. I can't bear Britain in decline, she told a BBC interviewer in April 1979. I just can't. Nor could we. For much of the 1970s, that decline had looked irreversible. Yet Margaret Thatcher stopped the rot. She cured the economy of the disease of inflation and industrial unrest. She revived the idea of a property-owning democracy. And with her courageous and principled foreign policy, she restored Britain's standing in the world. Those of us who stood by her are entitled to feel proud that we were on history's winning side. But we should have no illusions about the humble, supporting roles we played. She was the leader. Proof that sometimes it really is a single individual who can change the course of history. In Margaret Thatcher's case, decidedly for the better. I'm Neil Ferguson, fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford for Prager University. Imagine a group of people who work to destroy Italy because they claim Italy's origins are illegitimate. Imagine further that these people maintain that of all the countries in the world, only Italy doesn't deserve to exist. And then imagine that these people vigorously deny that they are anti-Italian. Would you believe them? Now substitute Israel for Italy, and you'll understand the dishonesty and absurdity of the argument that one could be anti-Zionist, that is, against the existence of a Jewish state, but not anti-Semitic. But that is precisely what anti-Zionists say. They argue that Israel's existence is illegitimate. They don't believe this of any other country in the world, no matter how bloody its origins. And then they get offended when they're accused of being anti-Semitic. How can they make this argument? First, they change the topic. They say it's unfair to charge those who merely criticize Israel with being anti-Semitic. But criticism of Israel is fine. Denying Israel's right to exist isn't. Anti-Zionism isn't criticism of Israel. Anti-Zionism is opposition to Israel's existence. Zionism is the name of the movement that advocates for the return of Jews to their historic homeland. Over the past 3,000 years, there were only two independent states located in what is called Israel. Both were Jewish states and invaders destroyed both. No Arab or Muslim or any other country ever existed in that land, which was only named Palestine by the Romans to remove all memory of the Jewish state they destroyed in the year 70. Second, anti-Zionists claim they can't be anti-Jewish because Zionism has nothing to do with Judaism. That's equally false. It is the same as saying Italy has nothing to do with being Italian. Judaism has always, always consisted of three components, God, Torah, and Israel. If Israel isn't part of Judaism, neither is the Bible or God. Third, anti-Zionists claim that Judaism is only a religion, therefore Jews are only members of a religion, not a nation. But the Jews are called a nation more than a hundred times in the Bible. That is why there can be irreligious, secular, and even atheist Jews, because Jews are not only a religion, they are also a people or a nation. There are no atheist Christians because Christianity is only a religion. Fourth, the anti-Zionists claim that Israel is illegitimate because it is racist. This is the fraudulent charge Israel haters and America haters make against two of the least racist societies in the world. Half of Israel's Jews are not even white, and anyone of any race or ethnicity can become a Jew. Plus, one of five Israelis isn't a Jew. And these Israeli citizens, mostly Arab Muslims, have the same rights as Jewish Israelis. As for Israel's control of the West Bank, that has nothing to do with race. Israel doesn't control the West Bank because Palestinians are of another race, but because Palestinians and their Arab allies tried to destroy Israel in 1967, and they lost the war. Palestinians have rejected offers to found their own state on five separate occasions since 1947. That's the only reason they don't have a state. And why have they always rejected building a Palestinian state? 
because they have always been more interested in destroying the Jewish state. Finally, the anti-Zionists claim that Israel's origins are illegitimate. Of all the world's 200-plus countries, the only country anti-Zionists declare illegitimate is also the only Jewish one. That's pretty much all you need to know about their motives. Why, for example, don't they make this claim about Pakistan? In 1947, nine months before the establishment of Israel, India was partitioned into a Muslim state, Pakistan, and a Hindu state, India. Unlike Israel, Pakistan had never existed before. Unlike Israel's founding, which created about 700,000 Jewish refugees from Arab lands and about 700,000 Arab refugees from what became Israel, the founding of Pakistan created about 7 million Muslim refugees from India and about 7 million Hindu refugees from Pakistan. And while the highest estimate of Arab deaths in the fighting that took place when Israel was established is 10,000, the number of deaths as a result of Pakistan's creation is around 1 million. So why is Israel's legitimacy challenged while Pakistan's isn't? There's only one answer. Israel is the one Jewish state. Of course, not all anti-Zionists hate all Jews. But if you seek to destroy Italy, you don't have to hate every Italian to be anti-Italian. If you seek to destroy the one Jewish state, you don't have to hate every Jew to be an anti-Semite. I'm Dennis Prager. Thank you for watching this video. To keep PragerU videos free, please consider making a tax-deductible donation. Napoleon Bonaparte was the most famous man of the 19th century. At the peak of his power, he personally controlled more of the European continent than anyone since the great emperors of Rome. Today, most people see him as an ambitious little man with an outsized ego. Others see him as a forerunner of the great aggressor of the 20th century, Adolf Hitler. This portrait is as flawed as it is unfair. Napoleon Bonaparte was born on the 15th of August 1769 on the Mediterranean island of Corsica. Ironically, the island, long connected to the city-state of Genoa, Italy, only became part of France the year before he was born. But for this twist of fate, Napoleon would never have been a French citizen, let alone its emperor. His parents sent him to the mainland at the age of nine, where he studied to be a soldier. His facility in mathematics, organization, and map reading marked him for future success. The French Revolution, with its overworked guillotine, provided a unique opportunity for advancement, that is, for anyone who could keep his head, literally. Napoleon did. He became a general by the age of 24. At the age of 26, he achieved a series of stunning victories in Italy against an Austrian army that had come to destroy the revolution and return the French royal family, the Bourbons, to the throne. These victories made him a national hero. As shrewd a politician as he was a general, by the first month of the new century, at the tender age of 30, Napoleon was the undisputed leader of France. He crowned himself emperor on December 2, 1804, turning the French Republic into the French Empire with a Bonaparte line of succession. Napoleon's establishment of a French Empire only increased the fears of the royal houses of Europe and of France's historical enemy, Britain. As a result, in September 1805, Austria invaded Bavaria, a French ally, and Russia joined the attack. Napoleon and his Grande Armée roundly defeated them at the Battle of Austerlitz. The Prussians were the next to test Napoleon, declaring war on him in 1806. The Austrians tried again in 1809. Napoleon didn't start any of these wars, but he won them all. When Russia broke an uneasy peace in 1812, Napoleon decided to invade. But this proved his undoing. His catastrophic winter retreat from Moscow cost him more than half a million casualties. The end came in June 1815 at the Battle of Waterloo, 
where the combined European armies, led by the Duke of Wellington, decisively defeated Napoleon's forces. The battle could have gone either way. Wellington himself described it as the nearest run thing you ever saw in your life. In all, Napoleon won 46 of the 60 battles he fought, drawing seven and losing seven. His record clearly marks him as one of the greatest military commanders of all time. Yet, while Napoleon is best remembered for his military exploits, it's his political reforms, both inside and outside of France, that had the most lasting effect. In France, he established the Code Napoleon, a distillation of 42 competing and often contradictory legal codes into a single body of French law. He modernized the French educational system and created the Sorbonne, which became one of the great universities of Europe. He promoted a building boom in Paris, a city whose architecture continues to enchant us. The bridges he built across the Seine and the sewer system he constructed beneath the city still function today. To Europe, Napoleon brought the best fruits of the French Revolution, concepts of equality and meritocracy. He liberated the Jews from the ghettos to which they had been confined for centuries, leading to an explosion of artistic, scientific, and economic innovation from this long-oppressed minority. It's hard to assess Napoleon because he was responsible for all these good things while also being responsible for much that was bad. But we can say this with certainty. To compare him to the murderous, oppressive dictators of the 20th century, like Hitler and Stalin, or their tin pot versions like Saddam Hussein or Colonel Gaddafi is a gross injustice. Napoleon was sui generis, unique unto himself, and proof positive that one man, given the right circumstances, can change history. I'm Andrew Roberts for Prager University. If the foundations of the new metaphysics are precarious and the presumptions that we are being asked to follow seem subtly wrong, then it is the addition into the mix of the communications revolution that is causing the conditions for a crowd madness. If we are already running in the wrong direction, then tech helps us to run there exponentially faster. It is this ingredient that is causing the sensation of the treadmill running faster than our feet can carry us. In 1933, James Thurber published The Day the Dam Broke, recalling his memories of the 12th of March 1913 when the whole of his town in Ohio went for a run. Thurber recalled how the rumour began that the dam had broken. Around noon, suddenly somebody began to run. It may be that he had simply remembered all of a moment an engagement to meet his wife for which he was now frightfully late. Soon somebody else began to run, perhaps a newsboy in high spirits. Another man, a portly gentleman of affairs, broke into a trot. Inside of ten minutes, everybody on High Street, from the Union Depot to the courthouse, was running. A loud mumble gradually crystallised into the dread word, Damn! The dam has broke! The fear was put into words by a little old lady in an electric, or by a traffic cop, or by a small boy. Nobody knows who, nor does it now really matter. Two thousand people were abruptly in full flight. Go east, was the cry that arose. East away from the river, east to safety. Go east, go east, go east. As the whole town stampedes to the east, nobody stops to consider that the dam is so far away from their town that it could not cause a trickle of water to flow across the high street. Nor does anybody notice the absence of water. The faster residents who have put miles of distance between themselves and the town eventually return home, as does everybody else. As Thurber says... The next day, the city went about its business as if nothing had happened, but there was no joking. It was two years or more before you dared treat the breaking of the dam lightly. And even now, twenty years after, there are a few persons who will shut up like a clam if you mention the afternoon of the great run. Today, our societies seem always on that run and always risking extraordinary shame over not just our own behaviour, but the way in which we have treated others. Every day there is a new subject for hate and moral judgment. It might be a group of schoolboys wearing the wrong hats in the wrong place at the wrong time. Or it could be anybody else. As the work of John Ronson and others on public shaming has shown, the internet has allowed new forms of activism and bullying in the guise of social activism to become the tenor of the time. The urge to find people who can be accused of wrong-think works because it rewards the bully. 
The social media companies encourage it because it is part of their business model. But rarely, if ever, do the people in the stampede try to work out why they are running in the direction they are. So I posted a video recently from Douglas Murray's book. Uh, I'm really enjoying it. I've, I've got hundreds of bookmarks from the last several books that I read, so I wish I did this more often. But that's what I'm doing in the car, and I want to share with you. It's really disgusting and kind of gross. Some of you might remember it was from 2013. It was a story out of Belgium. Um, and as the title says, it's someone who says, I don't want to be a monster. But to set it up, the discussion in the book is about how culture is moving so fast, and we're starting to cancel things at a rate that's just mind-boggling that a couple things aren't happening. There's not the self-reflection. There's not the, the self uh, cynicism of, is what I believe correct? Am I moving in the right direction? Why do I hold the beliefs that I hold? And it's interesting because I've had these discussions in, in my regular life. His examples are, you know, in the Victorian era where there are people clamoring about using kids as chimney sweeps, you know, during slavery, you had a very, very small percentage of people speaking out against it. And the political and religious alignments of those people is interesting. Uh, you know, there's a, a this group called the 3%, right, that believes in the Revolutionary War. It was only about 3% of the contingent of 3% of Americans that really resisted the British and felt like independence was a necessity. And look what they accomplished. Ditto slavery. Uh, and I was thinking about an example. I had a sparring bout with a buddy recently. We were talking about the New Testament and about how few people actually realized who Jesus was and respected those powers and whether they understood the prophecies or the scriptures or not, looked at him and said, could it be? Is it? Maybe? Uh, and then even when during the, the question originally came up, during the arraignment of Christ, would you have voted for Barabbas to be released or Christ? And of course, we all like to say Christ, but there were very few that did. Most of them said Barabbas, Barabbas. And it's kind of like with being a Nazi in Germany. Jordan Peterson has this clip, and I, I posted it years ago now, where he said, in all probability, if you lived in Germany during World War II, you would have been a Nazi. Why? Because it's just too much of a hassle to go against the grain. It's a risk to your livelihood. It's a risk to your personal safety. It's a risk to your family. You're not going to belong. You're going to be ostracized. You're going to be an outsider. All those psychological triggers will limit you from doing the right thing if you don't put invest time and effort into making sure you know what the right thing is. It's easier just to ignore it. And obviously, this isn't all comprehensive. But in this story, um, Douglas Murray talks about someone named Nancy Vorhelst, Vorhelst, sorry, I said it wrong. And she eventually ends up being Nathan Vorhelst. I won't spoil it for you, but listen to it. It really, really is a sad and tragic story. But he asked the question, in 50 years, what is the next generation going to look back at, at us and say, it was so obvious. How could you be so stupid? You were racist, bigots, sexist, xenophobic, homophobes. Uh, how could you be so blind? And it's interesting because this has to do with the transgender movement. Ben Shapiro once said that'll be abortion because it'll be so obvious medically that all the lies they've been telling about abortion since the 70s don't hold up. It is a child. It is alive. It's human offspring. It has a beating heart. It doesn't deserve to die. If you believe in, you know, uh, the principles of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, you can't justify doing this out of convenience. Blah, blah, blah. Anyway, the point here is that I interviewed a gentleman named uh, Walt Heyer years ago. He's been he's made the rounds for a while now, but I interviewed him and I'll link to it. It'll be at the end of this video. And he talked about how he has been through a transition, he's been through a detransition, and the thing that amazed him was so many people raw rod him and cheered for him and said, I believe in you and you're doing the right thing. Even his work was so happy about him transitioning from male to female. He goes, but as soon as I was done and I turned myself into a freak, all the clamoring went away, all the ticker tape parade gone, all the support gone. And as soon as I decided to detransition, turn the other way, venom in my direction, nonstop. And he said, they talk about allies all the time. He said, and it was really what they should be saying is the bridge is out. There's nothing there but misery. And my line I use on Medium all the time that upsets people is a transgender ally is someone who tells you that happiness is at the bottom of the cliff. Anyway, listen to the story about Nathan Vorhelst and tell me what else afterwards, first of all, it's shocking and gross, but also tell me at the end of this clip where the person says, I don't want to be a monster anymore. Tell me what you think our culture will be canceled for 50 years from now. What things have I missed? What are the things we look back and say, how could you have been so stupid when all along the way we were so sure we were right and not just right, but we were righteous. Enjoy. 
Every age before this one has performed or permitted acts that to us are morally stupefying. So, unless we have any reason to think we are more reasonable, morally better or wiser than at any time in the past, it is reasonable to assume there will be some things we are presently doing, possibly while flushed with moral virtue, that our descendants will whistle through their teeth at and say, what the hell were they thinking? It is worth wondering what the blind spots of our age might be. What might we be doing that will be regarded by succeeding generations in the same way we now look on the slave trade or using Victorian children as chimney sweeps? Take the case of Nathan Verhelst, who died in Belgium in September 2013. Nathan had been born a girl and was given the name Nancy by her parents. She grew up in a family of boys and always felt that her parents preferred her three brothers to her. There was certainly plenty that was strange about the family. After Verhelst's death, his mother gave an interview to the local media in which she said, When I saw Nancy for the first time, my dream was shattered. She was so ugly. I had a phantom birth. Her death does not bother me. I feel no sorrow, no doubt or remorse. We never had a bond. For reasons that this and other comments make clear, Nancy grew up feeling rejected by her parents and at some stage settled on the idea that things might be better if she was a man. In 2009, in her late thirties, she began taking hormone therapy. Shortly after this, she had a double mastectomy and then a set of surgeries to try to construct a penis. In total, she had three major sex change operations between 2009 and 2012. At the end of this process, Nathan, as he then was, reacted to the results. I was ready to celebrate my new birth, but when I looked in the mirror, I was disgusted with myself. My new breasts did not match my expectations, and my new penis had symptoms of rejection. There was significant scarring from all the surgery Verhelst had undergone, and he was clearly deeply unhappy in his new body. There is a photograph of Verhelst as Nathan on a sparsely populated Belgian beach. He is squinting from the sunlight as he looks into the camera. Despite the tattoos covering part of his chest, the scarring from the mastectomy is still visible. In a photo from another occasion, he is lying on a bed in shoes and a suit, looking uncomfortable in his body. The life that Nathan had clearly hoped for had not come about, and depression soon followed, so in September 2013, at the age of 44, only a year after the last sex change procedure, Verhelst was euthanised by the state. In his country of birth, euthanasia is legal and the relevant medical authorities in Belgium agreed that Verhelst could be euthanised due to unbearable psychological suffering. A week before the end, he held a small party for some friends. Guests reportedly danced and laughed and raised glasses of champagne with the toast to life. A week later, Verhelst made the journey to a university hospital in Brussels and was killed by lethal injection. I do not want to be a monster, he said, just before he died. It is not hard to imagine future generations reading such a story in a spirit of amazement. So the Belgian Health Service tried to turn a woman into a man, failed and then killed her. Hardest of all to comprehend might be the fact that the killing, like the operations that preceded it, was performed not in a spirit of malice or of cruelty, but solely in the spirit of kindness. Of course, the case of Verhelst is unusual in all sorts of ways, but it is worth focusing on precisely because some of the lessons it raises are reflected upon so little. What is trans? Who is trans? What makes someone trans? Are we sure that it exists as a category? And if so, are we certain that attempting to turn somebody physically from one sex to another is always possible, or even the best way to deal with the conundrum this presents? Among all the subjects in this book and all the complex issues of our age, none is so radical in the confusion and assumptions it elicits and so virulent in the demands it makes as the subject of trans. There is no other issue, let alone one affecting relatively few people, that has so swiftly reached the stage whereby whole pages of newspapers are devoted to its latest developments and where there is a never-ending demand not just to change the language but to make up the science around it. The debate around gay rights moved too swiftly for some people, but it still took decades to go from acceptance that homosexuality existed and might need to be accommodated to the position where gay marriage was legalised. By contrast, trans has become something close to a dogma in record time. "'Twas the night before Christmas, and all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. You probably know what happens next. 
But do you know who wrote this poem and when? Do you know where the tradition of the Christmas tree comes from? Lights on the Christmas tree, stockings, even the idea of gift giving. No holiday has a richer and more varied tradition than Christmas. So let's look into its history and see if we can uncover some of that richness and tradition. And if you don't celebrate Christmas, well, at least you'll have a better appreciation of why so many people do. Here's what everybody knows. Christmas is when Christians celebrate the birthday of Jesus Christ. That in itself is a very big deal. Christianity, in all its many iterations, remains the most popular religion in the world. Two billion people follow it. Aside from its obvious religious significance, the first Christmas stands as the great divide for the recording of human history. Until recently, history was divided between B.C., before Christ, and A.D., Anno Domini, which is Latin for Year of Our Lord. Now, you'll often see B.C.E., before the Common Era, and C.E., Common Era. No matter, the divide is still Jesus' birth. The great kings of the first millennium recognized the significance of the day and attached themselves to it. Charlemagne, Alfred the Great, and William the Conqueror, among many others, were either baptized or coronated on December 25th. The idea of Christmas as a time of gift-giving also goes back to the earliest days of Christianity. The story is told that a third-century church bishop, Nicholas, would anonymously throw bags of gold coins into the windows of the poor. The coins supposedly landed in the shoes or stockings that were drying by the fireplace. Thus was the stocking stuffer born. After Nicholas died and was declared a saint, his popularity and positive Christmas message spread across Europe, each nation adding its own distinct contribution. In Germany, the winter tradition of placing evergreens in their homes took on a new significance in the 16th century when Protestant reformer Martin Luther put candles in the branches. He told his children the lights were like the sky above Bethlehem on the night of Christ's birth. The idea that St. Nicholas would judge whether you've been good or bad during the year stems from the book of Revelation in the New Testament, which depicts Christ returning to earth riding a white horse. In the Middle Ages, the legend sprang up that St. Nicholas had been chosen as the Savior's advanced guard. He wouldn't come at the end of the world, but every year to check things out and give a report. When this notion arrived in Norway, it encountered a problem. There were no horses in Norway, but they did have plenty of reindeer. And of course, Norway abuts the Arctic Circle and the North Pole, so St. Nick found himself with a new domicile. All these various European traditions came together in the great melting pot of America. In New York in 1823, a professor at the Protestant Episcopal Seminary, Clement Moore, wrote a poem for his children. "'Twas the night before Christmas." The stockings were hung by the chimney with care in hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there. The poem caught on and became a Christmas staple every school child could recite. The holiday got another push in 1843 when the great British writer Charles Dickens published his short novel, A Christmas Carol. The redemption of Ebenezer Scrooge perfectly captured what we now refer to as the Christmas spirit the idea that the holiday brings out the best in all of us. As the new century turned, Hollywood got into the act. Almost as soon as there were movies, there were movies celebrating Christmas. To this day, a year doesn't go by without a new one. Madison Avenue saw a big opportunity, too. In 1931, Coca-Cola hired artist Haddon Sundblom to create a Christmas ad of Santa Claus, which is Dutch for St. Nicholas, drinking Coke. The jolly white-bearded fellow in a bright red suit remains the personification of old St. Nick. And in perfect melting pot fashion, Irving Berlin, the son of a rabbi, wrote the definitive Yuletide song, White Christmas. Many complain today that the religious aspect of Christmas has been overwhelmed by commerce. Retail sales between Thanksgiving and Christmas are now $1 trillion. This is not a new complaint. The Puritans refused to celebrate Christmas because they thought it trivialized the holiday's religious message. But this remains the minority view. Most people love Christmas and all the things, the lights, the tree, the songs, the movies, and yes, the gifts that come with it. And who can deny that people tend to act a little nicer, a little happier 
as the special day draws near. In a world that feels so divided, Christmas still unites us. For that, we should all be grateful. I'm William Federer, author of There Really Is a Santa Claus for Prager University. Thank you for watching this video. To help keep PragerU videos free, Do Republicans win elections by preventing minorities, blacks, Latinos, and others from voting? For those on the left and their allies in the major media, the answer is yes. Even more than that, it's an article of faith. The usual example they offer is state laws, often passed by Republican majority legislatures, requiring voters to present a photo ID at their polling place, something required in almost every other democracy in the world. According to the left, Voter ID depresses minority turnout and is therefore a blatant form of racial discrimination. But there's a problem with this accusation. There's no evidence to support it. Minorities are voting in greater numbers and at higher percentages than ever before. The facts and figures are there for anyone to see. Still, progressives and most of the political press don't seem to have noticed. Or maybe they just don't want to look. At a 2019 NAACP dinner in Detroit, California Senator Kamala Harris told the audience that voter suppression in Georgia and Florida cost Democrats gubernatorial races in the 2018 midterm elections. Let's say this loud and clear, said Ms. Harris. Without voter suppression, Stacey Abrams would be the governor of Georgia. Andrew Gillum is the governor of Florida. A few days earlier, Ms. Abrams herself, apparently still bitter over her defeat, made a similar claim. We had an architect of voter suppression that spent the last eight years knitting together a system of voter suppression that is unparalleled in America, said Ms. Abrams, in reference to her Republican opponent, a former Georgia Secretary of State. But if minorities are harmed by mandating voter ID and other anti-fraud measures, such as removing inactive voters from registration rolls, why does the evidence all point to the opposite conclusion? A recent Census Bureau report found that voter turnout in 2018 climbed 11 percentage points from the last midterm election in 2014, surpassing 50% for the first time since 1982. Moreover, the increased turnout was largely driven by the same minority voters Democrats claim are being disenfranchised. Black turnout grew around 27%, and Hispanic turnout increased about 50%. None of this comes as news to anyone who pays attention to sober facts instead of inflammatory rhetoric. The black voter turnout rate, for the most part, has grown steadily since the 1990s. This has occurred notwithstanding an increase in state voter ID requirements over the same period. In 2012, blacks voted at higher rates than whites nationwide, including in Georgia, which was one of the first states in the country to implement a photo ID requirement for voting. Ms. Abrams claims that Republicans have been hard at work trying to disenfranchise black voters. But the reality is that black voter registration is outpacing white registration in the Peach State. These gains are not limited to blacks. Voting has been up substantially in all minority groups. An analysis of the census data published by Pew Research Center found that all major racial and ethnic groups saw historic jumps in voter turnout in 2018. Political scientist Teku Lee confirmed this in an op-ed for the New York Times, in which she highlights impressive voting rates for minority women. The 2018 election set new benchmarks for turnout in a midterm election, with a whopping 30 million more people voting than in 2014. For women of color, the increased turnout was even more stark, at 37%. As to the issue of ensuring the accuracy and integrity of U.S. elections, minority voters appear to be as concerned as everyone else. Ms. Harris and Ms. Abrams may feel that requiring an ID for banking, flying, or buying cold medicine should not apply to voting, but most people don't seem to have that problem. In a 2016 Gallup poll, voter ID laws were supported by four and five respondents, including 95% of Republicans, 63% of Democrats, 81% of whites, and 77% of non-whites. So, if there is no serious opposition to voter ID laws and no evidence of voter suppression, if, in fact, more people of different races and ethnicities are voting at higher rates than ever before, why won't this voter suppression myth die? The answer is at once surprising and obvious. One party simply can't accept that they will lose a close election. 
If a Republican wins one of those, there has to be a nefarious reason. Voter suppression is as good as any, even if it has no basis in fact. Ms. Abrams lost, by the way, by over 50,000 votes. Elections are decided by the state of the economy, foreign policy issues, candidate personalities, and a host of other factors. The non-existent problem of voter suppression is not one of them. I'm Jason Riley, Senior Fellow at the Manhattan Institute for Prager University. Thank you for watching this video. To keep PragerU videos free, please consider making a tax-deductible donation. So my name is Scott Bornstein and I am a pediatric oncologist and I take care of children, teenagers, and young adults with cancer. I could not do my job without the volunteers who donate their blood and their platelets for our patients. The reasons why platelets are so important for cancer patients is that a lot of the treatments we use to treat cancer can have side effects. And one of the side effects is, is it affects your body's ability to make normal blood cells. And so after you get certain types of chemotherapy, your body can't make platelets and so your platelet count falls and it makes you more likely to bleed. And so one of the ways that we help and support our patients that get intensive chemotherapy is we have to give them platelet transfusions. I just want to thank everybody who donates their blood to help our patients. We could not uh, treat our patients without you and you have my heartfelt gratitude. What if you could do one thing on Monday that might save a cancer patient's life on Wednesday? When you donate platelets, that's exactly what can happen. Platelets are tiny cells in your blood that form clots and stop bleeding. If you've ever fallen off your bike or cut yourself shaving, you've seen them in action. But these little cells do their best work helping cancer patients who often lack platelets due to the cancer or as a side effect of treatment. Platelets also prevent blood loss in patients undergoing surgery and organ transplants. Without platelets, patients wouldn't survive. They save lives every day. The challenge? Platelets are in constant demand by hospitals. And because platelets must be used within five days, new donors are needed every day. That's why we need you. Platelet donation is a little different than giving blood. Here's how it works. You'll make an appointment at a Red Cross donation center. During your visit, we'll draw blood through one arm, extract your platelets in a machine, and return the rest through your other arm. Relax, watch a movie, listen to music. A few hours later, you'll have donated enough platelets to help as many as three patients. So if you give on Monday, by Wednesday, she'll be able to recover quickly. He'll have a safe and successful surgery and she will have the strength she needs to keep fighting. To learn more or schedule an appointment, visit redcrossblood.org slash platelets or call 1-800-RED-CROSS. I went through probably the hardest thing that I'll ever go through in my life when I was diagnosed with cancer. As I slowly began to process what was going on, I became pretty afraid and pretty scared that I might not get better. When we got the phone call from the doctor that day, it was like an out-of-body experience. When he said, your son has leukemia, I, we were just in shock. Troy needed blood and platelets right when he was admitted to the hospital, as soon as he was diagnosed. One of the times when we were in clinic and Troy was receiving chemotherapy, he also needed to get some platelets. And um, we were waiting for them to come. And the nurse would come in and say, oh, the platelets aren't here yet. You know, another half an hour or hour would pass and they're still not here yet. There's a shortage of platelets. My mom and I were both pretty concerned that I wasn't gonna get the platelets in time. And I became pretty afraid and pretty scared that I might not get better. So watching Troy's health improve after getting blood and platelet products, it was amazing to see him go from this almost lifeless boy 
to a son who had energy and more life to him. I'm extremely happy every single day to just be able to spend time with my family and just spending time with my friends again and playing sports with them again and being a part of the community at my school. To all the blood and platelet donors, I just want to say thank you so much for helping my son Troy get better and giving him strength and giving him life. It means the world to me.